All right, so now we're going to go ahead and start with our thyroid disorders. How many <clears throat> As a little AMP review, um, the thyroid um, has two lobes. It's connected by a small little bridge called the isthmus. All right, so you have your left and your right. It's strategically placed um, right below the... Um, the larynx, you know, kind of goes below and comes up on the sides. And so when you have removals, there's different complications that can occur. So our T3 and T4 are released from the thyroid gland in response to TSH that's sent down to the uh, thyroid gland from the pituitary gland. All right? So when our levels are low, the message is sent down and there are large levels of, you know, TSH that's released and you have T3 and T4 that's produced. T3 is your thyroxine, I'm sorry, T4 is your thyroxine and T3, if you think of TRIO, that's your triodothyronine. And then we also have calcitonin that's released and that helps to promote deposits of calcium into the bone when what when what's occurring? When we have high levels of calcium in the bloodstream, calcium gets taken away and gets deposited into bone. And then if we have low levels in the bloodstream, then the bone breaks down and then calcium is released. Okay, and then that one's controlled by the parathyroid gland, so they have opposite functions. Okay. So for hyperthyroidism, it's the most common um, hypothyroid disease, Graves' disease, and that's an excessive amount of um, thyroid that's being produced, usually seen in women younger than 40, also seen in women post-pregnancy. Um, a lot of women are diagnosed with, um, excuse me, take that back, hypothyroidism post-pregnancy. So take that back, sorry. Um, so your numbers that you need to be familiar with here, yeah, it's, it's hypothyroidism is post-pregnancy. That's why I said I take that back, sorry. Um, T3 and T4 levels are going to be elevated and your TSH is going to be decreased. So if you do that little side-by-side -side comparison with your numbers, that's pretty much all you need to know as far as what levels are going to be elevated and what levels are going to be decreased. Um, when you're looking at a thyroid panel, someone thinks that if your TSH level is high, that's your hyperthyroid, but really it's the opposite. So if your TH levels are high, you're hypothyroid, and if your TSH, TSH levels are low, you're hyperthyroid. So there are some signs and symptoms that patients present with. And again, if you do that side-by-side -side comparison with your signs and symptoms, um, I think it's an easier way um, to study for this. So you can have tachycardia. With that tachycardia, you can also present with some arrhythmias. One of the main arrhythmias is going to be atrial fibrillation. Okay. Um, you can have tremors, increased blood pressure, increased respirations kind of very similar to the catecholamine release because everything's going to be elevated. Your metabolism is going to be working pretty, um, pretty high. Goiters are present if someone has hypo or hyperthyroid. Okay, hypo or hyper. I'm hypo, I have a goiter. Um, and they could be nodular or, you know, not nodular. Um, yeah, that's an excessive goiter. Um, you know, they have some that are, you know, kind of small and you don't see them, and then they have some where they actually occlude uh, your airway because they're so big and they can cause some dysphagia issues as well. Um, goiters can have nodules in them, and those nodules are going to be palpable. So the way that you check someone to see if they have a thyroid is the provider will stand behind you, and they'll put their hands, you know, right here on each side of your throat, and they'll tell you to swallow. And if you can't swallow, because I know I can't swallow when the doctor puts his hands around my neck, so you have to drink something, and then you swallow. Your thyroid normally is not palpable. You should not be able to feel it. Um, if you have an enlarged thyroid, if you have a, a goiter, 
whether it's due to hypo or hyperthyroid, you're definitely going to feel it. Um, and if you feel nodules, usually the doctors will do different tests to see if they're cancerous nodules or if they're benign. All right, and we'll talk about some of those tests. Clinical testing, you're going to have an ultrasound. Ultrasound is a good way to check the size of the thyroid. Um, it's not checking function or, you know, anything else. It's just checking um, the size and also checking for nodules, making sure you don't have any nodules. And then the uh, radiation uh, active, the radioactive iodine uptake test, that is not radio, that's not radiation. Okay, it's just a radioactive iodine where you will take a capsule that has liquid in it and you're going to get a scan at 6 hours and you get a scan at 12 hours and it checks the uptake of the iodine because the thyroid is responsible for putting iodine out in our system too, right? So it's going to check the iodine, it's going to check the function. So if you have an increased uptake of the iodine or if you have a decreased uptake of the iodine, it's going to let the provider know. With having that radioactive iodine test done, there are some things that we have to educate our patients on avoiding because we don't want a false positive. So we want to avoid any foods or any medications that have iodine in them. If you're already on supplemental therapy, like your levothyroxine, your Synthroid, or um, even PCU um, for someone who has hyperthyroid, you want to avoid those at least six weeks prior to the exam, not six weeks after, six weeks prior to the exam. Um, any vitamins, any sinus or cold medication because a lot of them have iodine in them. And again, you don't want to have a false positive. So um, that's definitely something that you will need to know. Okay. For someone who has hyperthyroid, besides having that radioactive iodine test done and the doctor doing a TSH T3, T4, panel, you know, that's just the panel that gets done. There's also something called a TRH, which is the thyroid stimulating hormone. And that test is done to see if something, if there is a malfunction going on with the hypothalamus or if there is something going on with the thyroid itself. Some other tests that you'll see for someone who has hyperthyroidism is if you did an EKG on them, you're going to see some altered waves. So you're going to see an altered P or altered T wave, and those are usually elevated. And then, of course, that cardiac arrhythmia, which is the atrial fibrillation that I talked about um, just a little bit ago. For the MRI and the ultrasound, those are basically just done to see if there are any tumors that are present. Someone who has hyperthyroid and it's starting to advance or someone is starting to prevent with that uh, storm. All right, so um, besides having those tests done, of course there's medications that have to get uh, initiated for someone who has hyperthyroid and usually that's the PTU. PTU is an anti-thyroid drug and also the tapazole, which is known as methamazole. And the action of that drug is to actually block iodine and to try and block those T3 and T4 levels. So, you know, they're trying to block that interaction. Results are usually not seen right away. It usually takes a couple weeks, usually peaking in 4 to 8. That would be something that you need to know. Um, methamazole is contraindicated in pregnant women. It can cause early abortions or miscarriages. And someone who has um, taken methamazole, you can also have some side effects. That's also something you're going to need to know. So there are going to be some GI upset. There can also be some agranulocytosis, which is extremely low levels of white blood cells. And you may also present with fever and rashes as well. And then you can also get given Lugol's solution. And that's a medication that helps to decrease that vascularity of the thyroid gland. And it also helps to prevent the release of T3 and T4. So it's also a blocker too. Um, the methamazole and the Lugol solution are given, again, if someone is having extreme cases of hyperthyroid. And it's also given prior to surgery as well because we want to make sure that our patient is stable. When someone has hyperthyroid, they have a lot 
of those uh, vital signs are abnormal. They're usually elevated, which makes someone unstable. So another medication that we're going to give is Indorol, has a double action. So it's used to help slow down the heart rate, and it can also help to bring down the blood pressure at the same time. You're given someone Indorol. What category of drug is that? A beta blocker. So what are some of your common side effects of a beta blocker? Decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure. So sometimes when you're given medications out on the floor, and before you give the medication, you may have a parameter that's in your electric EMR um, that says to hold for a heart rate less than 60. So then you would have to, of course, make sure that you take that heart rate. Are you doing a radial pulse check or are you doing apical? Okay, so just make sure that you remember that. Okay, so you're going to do an apical um, pulse rate and you're going to check it for 60. Now, what if the heart rate was 61? What would you do? Okay, so you could double check and then say you double checked and you triple checked and someone else checked and the heart rate is still 62. So what would you do? It's kind of that borderline, like, should I or shouldn't I? So it's kind of like a, a nurse's preference. Um, it could be that, you know, maybe your patient's asymptomatic, you know, they're not, you know, acting any kind of way, and you can give it. Me, personally, 61, mm, I probably would hold it and then check it the next time. You can always definitely call the doctor because we want a CYA, right? Um, it could be that it was 61 that second you took it, but maybe it was 59 or 60 when you you know, took your hand away, so it's, you know, it's kind of a 50-50 a thing, but whenever in doubt, you know, always call the primary care doctor and make sure that you, you know, get clarification that way, okay? Um, let's see. When we give Lugol solution, make sure that you do your iodine check. Always check allergies with your patients. Um, Lugol solution has an iodine base, so if your patient has iodine allergies, you know, that's a medication that we would want to avoid. And we also would not want to give Lugol solution to anyone that was pregnant because then that would initiate an early, you know, a miscarriage or early abortion. <clears throat> now, our radioactive iodine um, that is definitely radiation treatment, and so that's why there's that radiation sign there. So radiation, just like we have someone who's on chemo or they get radiation, it's used to destroy tissue, right? That's what radiation does. So um, when someone has the radioactive iodine, it's given um, orally to go ahead and destroy some of that thyroid tissue because we have someone who is overactive, they're hyperactive. Right? So maybe medications aren't working. You know, they're not sufficient. Maybe the person had hyperthyroidism for quite some time, and so now it's beyond that treatment stage of being able to take some PO pills. So we're going to go ahead and do the radiation. Um, radiation is usually uh, maybe, you know, one, two, or three times max for the treatment. And then there are some things that we want to avoid. You're a nurse. You're taking care of someone who has radiation implants or some type of radiation treatment. So what are you going to do as a nurse when you're providing care for this patient? Okay, so make sure that you have your proper PPE on, right? Um, and times for these patients should be limited to no more than 20 minutes. Okay, 20 to 30 minutes max. Um, so you want to make sure that if you have a dressing change or if you have to insert a Foley or if you, whatever care it is that you have to do with this patient, you want to make sure that they are, that you have everything that you need, you know, you wheel it in the room and that you get everything done. So that way you're not coming in and out, in and out, in and out. You're also going to have a monitor on you, which is a, a dosimeter, and that's checking your radiation levels and your exposure. So our patients who have radiation treatments, we have to talk about some precautions, you know, things that they're not allowed to do, things that they have to avoid, or people that they have to avoid. So we're going to avoid pregnant women, even after they've delivered six months, so post-pregnancy, about six months. 
Um, no small children, especially children that are in the, um, the stage of puberty. Um, no one who is immunocompromised. Uh, we're going to let them know that there is no sharing of utensils, no sharing toothbrush, um, no intimacy, all right, um, no sharing, uh, sleeping in the same bed. You have to avoid that. Um, for Usually it's about two, not six months, um, usually it's about uh, two to three weeks, um, about two to three weeks. So there's a lot of avoiding um, that's going on. So nursing interventions, you know, vital signs are always um, a priority. All right, if our patient is presenting with side effects of the radiation, our nursing interventions are going to be geared to, geared to what? What are our nursing interventions geared toward? Okay, so comfort, safety, care, and comfort. So if our patient is presenting with any signs and symptoms, our care is going to be geared toward those signs and symptoms, right? So if they have abdominal pain, we're going to treat the abdominal pain with whatever is being offered at that time. If they're having diarrhea, then maybe they may need some Lamotil or some pepto or, you know, a BRAT diet or, you know, IV fluid. So whatever those signs and symptoms are, we're going to replace fluids and electrolytes. If we're vomiting and we have diarrhea, we're losing electrolytes, so we're going to replace those. How are we going to replace those? Slowly. Okay, slowly. There's a variety of ways. There's diet. We can put it in the diet, or it could be IV, or it could be PO. So just the overall, you know, understanding is that if you're losing electrolytes, you have to replace them, right? You have to replenish them. Um, always be familiar with your foods that are high in you know, mag, iron, calcium, potassium, you know. Um, protecting the eyes, you know, depending on how that radiation is being delivered. You can also have um, lubricating eye drops because eyes can get dried out. High carbs, high proteins always helps to facilitate healing and to provide metabolism. All right. And um, pre-op teaching is always good pre-op, post-op teaching is always good pre-op. And then, you know, if that doesn't uh, work, then our patient can go into a condition called thyroid storm, which is the excessive version of hyperthyroid, also called thyrotoxicosis as well. So this is an emergent situation and we need to prepare our patient for surgery. So it's going to be an abrupt onset of fever, something you need to remember, abrupt onset of fever, okay, sweating, tachycardia, um, your patient can um, have uh, flash pulmonary edema, CHF, you know, they kind of go together, and definitely restless. So when the patient presents to the emergency room, this needs to be a very quick diagnosis that the primary care provider needs to do. They need a diagnosis very quickly. Treatment needs to get implemented very quickly. Signs and symptoms of the thyroid storm, you can have an excessive weight loss, you know, something that happens very abruptly. Um, AFib or SVT, which is supraventricular tachycardia, all right. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, change of mental status. So prepping our patient for surgery. IV fluids, patient's going to get PTU. Um, IV dye, dexamethasone, um, quiet, cool environment because our patient has a fever. We want to bring that heart rate down. So what are we going to do? We're going to treat with the beta blocker. The, the preferred beta blocker for the thyroid storm is going to be the Enderol. Cooling blanket for the fever as well and then of course preparing for surgery. PTU has um, good benefits but then there's also some side effects. And one of them is acute liver failure. So we want to make sure that we monitor our patient's liver functions.
And if there is a woman who's pregnant and she has gone into this thyroid storm stage and she has to get prepped for surgery, the doctor definitely has to let her know that the medication that we're giving you may induce, you know, early labor, you know, or it may cause some uh, fatality issues with the, the fetus. So then that mother would then have to decide, you know, do I want this? You know, if they don't have it, they could die. Then she can die and the baby can die. So, you know, it has to be a very quick diagnosis, quick treatment, quick education, and then it has to be a quick decision. So that way you can um, work it out. And I'm going to stop it right here for a moment. Pollock. Our next slide that's going to come up is going to be the thyroidectomy. So this is where we're going to stop and we're going to divide up into the groups, but I do just want to just briefly just talk about a couple of the different um, percentages. So with a thyroidectomy, it's a removal of the thyroid gland. It's either going to get removed partially or totally, but totally isn't always 100%. It's usually like maybe 85, you know, 90%. Um, and so your, your patient with a subtotal thyroidectomy, your patient's not going to need or should not need any thyroid replacement. It should not put them in a hypothyroid state. Someone who has a total thyroidectomy is definitely going to go from hyperthyroid right to hypothyroid and they're going to need replacements for the rest of their life. So I just want to, um, just to kind of go over this, uh, just slide real quickly. Um, you always want to make sure that you check that bandage, um, you know, that's around the patient's neck. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're not necessarily, especially if it's post-op day one and the surgeon um, hasn't removed it first, but you still can check for bleeding. You're just going to look at the bandage. It's going to be a gauze and a cling, right? So you'll be able to tell if there's bleeding through there because you'll be able to see the bleeding. Um, and then also, You'll always check behind the head. You want to check for pulling because just looking at the front of the neck, you may not see any bleeding, but it could all be pulling behind the patient and on the pillow. And that's what we usually do in the simulation. We usually put some blood like behind the head to see if somebody um, picks it up. Uh, semi Fowler's position, there were a couple of you who just raised the head of the bed and I think the patient was trying to help themselves. Remember, no tension you know, on that site. The patient should not be moving their head around. You want to kind of turn their head with their body, all right? And then you also, if you're lifting their head or if you're checking, you want to support them behind their neck and their head. You want to give them support when you're helping to lift them up. Of course, you know, lift the head of the bed up first and then you could go ahead and then assist them that way. Okay, so trach at the bedside, O2, and we talked about the calcium glutinate or the calcium chloride and then, of course, following up with diet, you know, high in calorie and that kind of thing. So finishing up, we're going to go over thyroiditis. And thyroiditis is just um, inflammation, itis, thyroid inflammation of the thyroid. That's usually in response to a viral condition. And just as acutely as it begins, it could resolve, okay? It can um, resolve and start. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common form of hypothyroidism, just like Graves' disease is the most common form of hyperthyroidism. And with this thyroiditis and the Hashimoto's, it's an autoimmune disorder, and it's just like the pancreas. Um, sometimes the pancreas, just for no known reason, will turn on itself, and that's the same thing that can happen with the thyroid. Due to a virus, the... Um, the thyroid can start to um, eat away at its own tissue. Those antibodies are developed. It's a slow, chronic, progressive disorder. So it's something that happens over time. <clears throat> so we have someone here who has AFib with RVR. And she has a temperature of 100.7 to 102 for the past week. And it's not responsive to Advil or Tylenol. Another way that you can tell that someone is in thyroid storm, even though we're talking about 
hypothyroid, um, this is a case study question that goes with the hyperthyroid, is that they have a fever. Remember, that's one of the signs and symptoms with the hyperthyroid, the thyroid storm. And it's not responsive to um, any antipyretic. The fever just, you know, it stays. It doesn't go away. She reports abdominal cramps, tremors, and palpitations. Her TSH is low, and her T3s are elevated. All right, so on admission, we have, and her THs are your T3 and T4. That's your thyroid hormones. So that's THs, thyroid hormones, are elevated. And so it's 101.6, respirations are 24, heart rate's 134, and the blood pressure is 156 over 98. Mm -hmm. So what should be your priority with this patient? She's in thyroid storm. So what are some of those nursing interventions? Okay, and so what beta, blo there. what beta blocker is that? Yeah, propranolol, enverol, right? So would they would go ahead and try to uh, control that blood pressure and that heart rate. And we may still give an antipyretic. We can also try some cooling blankets or some of those cooling packs. If the patient has AFib with RVR, um, even though we're given the beta blocker for the heart rate, it doesn't do anything for the rhythm. So we could give an anti-rhythmic, you know, maybe give some digoxin to try and bring that, or cardizem to bring that um, heart rate down and the patient may even um, convert. So these are some of the nursing interventions that we already talked about. Um, and here goes a question. Uh, NCLEX style, the nurse is preparing a client with Graves' disease to receive radioactive iodine therapy. The nurse tells the client which of the following about the therapy. B? O D. So there's a, a wide range of answers. I think there's a little bit of everything. So let's go ahead and um, talk through. All right. So the following, the initial dose, there will be additional lifelong doses. Now this is the uh, radioactive iodine. So are we going to have like lifelong doses of this? No. Um, this drug will the, destroy the gland with one dose. No, it may take two or three, right, in, in time. And then the radioactivity will restrict your family contact for several weeks. Now, with the radioactive iodine, it's not going to restrict your contact. Um, so it takes six to eight weeks after treatment is started to relieve therapy because it takes time. It takes, you know, could take up to two months um, or so before it... Um, before you start to see some results. So with the Hashimoto's, um, here you can see that this guy has a little bit of facial swelling and um, his neck is a little big, so the goiter has grown in size. So just like the T3s are elevated and the TSH is low with hyperthyroid, with hypothyroid, your TSH is going to be high and your T3 and T4, which are your thyroid hormones, are going to be lower. Some signs and symptoms of hypothyroid, you know, don't forget to do that side-by-side -side comparison. Um, that would definitely help you. Personality changes, fatigue, some, you know, edema. You can have some slowed speech or some memory impairment, so you're a little bit more forgetful than you were. Um, with hyperthyroid, you have a heat intolerance. With hypothyroid, you have a cold intolerance, so you're, you're cold. You know, even if it's warm out, sometimes you're more cold than usual. Um, dry skin, brittle nails, insomnia, you know, anxiety. You can have some alopecia. You can have some hair falling out. And then that's just, uh, you know, uh, not a mnemonic, but just a, a thing with your, um, some more uh, disorders. So the treatment is, well, we have less thyroid hormone, right? 
so we have to replace it. And so that's going to be with our levothyroxine, um, synthroid, levo, uh, levothyroid, levothyroid, you know, they're all, they're all the same. Um, medications are usually started at a small dose, so maybe about 25 mics, and then it gets increased every couple weeks. Your blood work gets done until the doctor kind of finds you in a comfortable therapeutic range, and then you'll just stay at that dose. With the hyperthyroid, those medications are not lifelong. You know, those are usually initiated when you're having some problems. But someone who's hyperthyroid always ends up hypothyroid. Whether their thyroid burns out or they have a thyroidectomy um, and through medication, they always end up hypothyroid. Doesn't take away the fact that they had hyperthyroid as part of their past medical history, but, you know, and then, then you're just going to add hypothyroid to it. But with someone who has hypothyroidism, you're on lifelong treatment. So that's going to get, um, that's going to be an education piece. As far as the medications potentiating the effects of other drugs, with anticoagulants, it's going to make those anticoagulants increase as far as their action. So if your patient's on anticoagulants, the doctor may want to decrease the dose of the anticoagulant. So then that way, it doesn't potentiate the effect and your patient doesn't bleed out. With digoxin, it does the opposite. It decreases the effectiveness of the digoxin. So then your dose may have to get increased um, while you're on your, your medication. And then antidepressants, it also, um, it decreases their effect, but it also causes something called rebound depression. So with the antidepressants, you know, antidepressants are supposed to, you know, help you feel a little happy and more jovial. Um, but with the thyroid, it's going to make you more depressed. So if it's making you more depressed, then your medication may have to get upped um, or the doctor would have to find something that um, doesn't have a contraindication. For medications, we should take them at the same time every day. Usually in the morning is preferred. All right. Um, and, of course, what are the signs and symptoms of hypothyroid? You know, you're going to be sluggish, you might have some insomnia, you're going to be cold, hair might be falling out, and, you know, weight gain, you know, puffiness in the face, you might have that, that swelling. Um, so with the medications, over time, all of those symptoms should start to resolve some type of way. So let your patients know that after about two weeks, they're going to start to feel better, and you know, then everything else will start to, um, to flip-flop. But if we're medicating one disease process, we have the, pro the possibility of it going to the other end of the spectrum. So not only should you be familiar with the signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroid, but your patients also have to know the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroid, so that way they can say, oh, you know what, I might be getting too much, something's going on, I'm having these signs and symptoms, I need to go to the doctors. And then the medication dose has to get adjusted. Medication dosages for hypothyroid is one of those medications that has to get readjusted, you know, quite frequently, you know, until they get it just right. Some patients will take a dose of Synthroid, and they'll do like every other day. You know, some take a dose on the, you know, even days and then take another dose on the odd days. They kind of alternate doses. Um, so, again, it's just one of those medications that needs to be uh, readjusted frequently. So with hyperthyroidism, you have the more severe case called the thyroid storm, stretch in. Okay. With hypothyroidism, you have the most severe case that's called myxedema coma. All right, so um, here, just like the thyroid storm is the life-threatening cause of hyperthyroidism, the myxedema coma is a life-threatening form of hypothyroidism. So this is where your patient may present with those hyperthyroid uh, signs and symptoms, but then they're also going to have some excessive swelling of the face and the neck area, okay, large um, goiter and more forgetfulness, sleeping for long hours, just extremely fatigued, sleeping all the time, can't wake up. You know, those type of patients, you have to keep an eye and say, you know what, 
that patient could possibly be going into a myxedema coma state. Again, this is a chronic progressive thing. So it may take years before the patient gets to this state. This usually does not happen if a patient is being medicated because they're getting some type of thyroid hormone replacement. This usually happens if someone hasn't been diagnosed with hypothyroid, they didn't know they had hypothyroid, and years has gone by and their condition 